Welcome to the scriptorium, to the writing room. Today we're skipping forward on this sixth program to plate number 12. You have had the minuscule letters, the small letters. We've just finished with the plain metallic capitals, and all you lack is the figures. So with the figures uh, in your hand, you'll be able to go ahead and use this in your everyday handwriting and I would use it as soon as possible with a broad nib at first for your grocery list, for letters to the milkman, and so on. Take notes in it. See, once you have it in your handwriting, then your personal rhythm will come in and your italic will be good italic, but it won't look like anyone else's because your personal rhythm will be there. And then you can use that in your formal work, in your semi-formal work. And the people who, who do professional work very often have a good rapid italic handwriting and they, their rhythm is to be seen in all of their work, their personal rhythm, which is as distinct as your walk. A friend can recognize you from your walk blocks away when he can't see your features, when he can't recognize clothing and whatnot, but the rhythm of your walk is as distinctive as your thumbprint. Well, let's look at these italic old style figures. Now, by the way, it is italic, too. It's not italic. And you wouldn't say Italian, so I hope nobody says italic. It's a short I, italic. Now, these are called old style. You'll notice in the text that I say they came into Europe in the 12th century. And they originated in India way back. The Arabs acquired them, and they, it took centuries for them to move through the Islamic countries. And finally, the uh, Arabs from Morocco brought them into Spain. And they spread very gradually from Spain into Italy and then into the rest of Europe. But it took several centuries for people to learn how to use them. The zero uh, was a mystery to them. And they didn't use them properly for, as say, for some centuries. Now they're called old style because of the fact that they have body height, ascenders and descenders. You'll notice here that one, two, and zero are the height of an M or an E, a lower case. Six and eight go part way up toward the ascending line. And then all the rest are descending figures, three, four, five, seven, and nine. That is the way P, G, Y, and so on would be descending. In the Middle Ages, the writing was in black letter, and very seldom was anything written out in majuscules or caps. The writing was uh, in lower case or, or minuscules. So they designed these figures, which they got from the Arabs, to go with lower case writing. Body height, descenders, and descenders. The uh, figures which we often see today are all the same height. Well, they weren't developed until in the 18th or early 19th century to be used in advertising. When you have something entirely in capital letters, you'll use the modern figures, which are all the same height. But now we call these uh, old style because they are previous to modern times, the advertising and so on, and have body height ascenders and descenders. Figures, because the individual design is a figure, it's not a number. I say, uh, when I use a figure as a, an adjective, say three pens, then it becomes a number. That is three pens. But when I make the design three, then it is a figure. Any one of these by itself is a figure. You start grouping them, and then you begin to get quantitative statements about various things. <coughs> and let's start with writing them right off. You'll notice that they don't go up to the to the ascender height. 
the one I show you has a hook, a hook head. It doesn't have a foot serif. I, I prefer to put a little slab serif on it and to put a fillet on that one. But I write it more like this, so that it, 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 it this by itself so it looks almost lost. It doesn't look like much of anything. It almost needs some sort of finishing stroke at head or a foot. But the two make a nice full curve. This point out here and this part at the foot line up at letter height. So uh, if you have a, let a, a letter of the alphabet next to that, you'll find that the stem will be parallel to that uh, imaginary line joining the beginning and the base. Uh, the zero, and by the way, it is a zero and not an O. The O in metallic is narrow. Uh, the zero is almost as wide as it is high. It's much wider than the O. And our, our zero is an extremely important uh, symbol in ancient culture, the circle of heaven. And zero is a mispronunciation through time of what was originally in Sanskrit, shanyat, which is the void, the no thing. And uh, I, I prefer to hear it as zero and not as a no. It has significance as a zero. Now, halfway here is the, uh, here is the riding line. Here is the waist line. Here is the ascender line. Down here is the descender line. So halfway between the waistline and the assembly line, let's start with six. And you know on the left side of six is part of an ellipse. The right side, part of the round or the circle. So the tricky thing about six is that you have to combine part of an ellipse with part of a circle. And the circular part doesn't quite come up to the uh, to the waistline. The eight, you'll have to practice an eight, but if you can make a good S, you'll be able to write a good eight. Make them quite round. And I'd lift the pen in doing this part. The six has slope through the lining up of the top and this part. Would well, you just go through the centers of these circles, and that gives you the slope of eight. Three. Halfway down to the descender line. Only halfway down to it. Because here's the riding line, here's the descender line. Now notice that the fingers of three here line up to indicate the slope. I call them fingers because one, one of the names for a, uh, a figure is digit, and digit in Latin means finger. And later in some other program, I will talk about one, two, and three, and so on, as uh, signs that were made at one time with fingers. Even nine, it's claimed, was a finger sign. Now, four is a Greek square and was a, that square in India. And then that sloping line here. They're joined this way. Uh, I can't take time to show you the history of this, but this is a four, whereas this is, I think, not a four at all. It's the square of Earth to begin with. This is north, east, south, and west. And um, this is winter spring, summer, and autumn, is birth, growth, maturity, death. A very rich symbol is in that four, but here it's lost completely. But more about that some other time. And the slope, of course, comes from that downstroke. And get the east part of this beautifully, the birth part. Five, you start over to the right and down just above the riding line.
Now, if you draw a, imagine a vertical in here, this begins, say here, but this part doesn't come to touch that vertical. It's a little to the right of the line of the vertical connecting the, the top part of the seven. If this comes to the left so that it lines up with this vertically, it, uh, it's, not, it's going to slope too much. It'll be very ugly. Now nine is a difficult, the small circular part. The lighting line is down here. Some lighters will make this clear down to the lighting line, but it, it gets too big in my eyes. And pull this down, pull it halfway down to the descender line so that the left side of the O part of the nine lines up with the terminal down here at the letter slope. Well, I think that's all the figures now. And there are only 10 of them. There are only nine and the zero. I wish I could talk about the significance of that. The fact that zero is a beginning. Uh, we reach nine, we have nine digits only. And then zero, it terminate one plus zero, you see, will terminate the decade and also begin the second decade. 99 will finish the first century and, uh, and then the one zero zero begins the second one, although in a sense it seems to finish the first one. It, uh, each, each ending is a beginning, each death is a rebirth. And of course that is India and the philosophy and religion of India and that's where our figures came from originally. Now they need to be widely spaced. Oh, before I go on with that, though, I'd like to comment on this three. I think the three should be rounded at the top. See, originally there are three fingers held held horizontally like this. Um, one, two, three. And with the two, you drew two fingers. But the hand rounded this upper corner. So just now are two fingers. Three was three fingers like that. The hand rounded these triangles, but didn't come back. It came right around here and made the accent here. So these are three, three fingers, and they line up the letter slope. But if you make this three, which you find occasionally, sometimes on clocks, sometimes in British design. That's a dangerous three because some fives that look like this, uh, with, if at a quick glance, looks very much like that three. And to keep three from looking like five, I would not use under any circumstances that horizontal. In, the, uh, in, in a fighter plane, for instance, uh, where the navigator sent the fighter, you couldn't, you wouldn't dare have that three because the light is very dim and he has to watch the figures very closely and if he doesn't read them accurately he may, he may be killed. So we need legible figures and by the way the four in the cockpit of a fighter, jet fighter plane is that. That is the ancient Indian, North Indian symbol which the Italians wrote this way and uh, that is they were it could also slope in North India. It would either be like that or it would be like an X. Well, the Italians made the X for him, but didn't lift the pen. So you turn that around, you see, and it becomes our, our four. They straighten it up vertically. It's a very beautiful figure, I think, especially if you allow enough east-west on the thing. <coughs> now, the figures need to be widely spaced. Let's take a... A, a zip code. My own one, for instance. Any number will do. I like writing the zip codes on the great amount of mail that I send out. If these are crowded, they aren't legible at all. And it's very strange that the old style 
figures, which have much in common with the minuscule, cannot be, uh, be put close together. The minuscule can, uh, but they have to be widely spaced, just like our, our capitals. And it shows that they're the product of a different culture, not Hebrew, Greek, Roman, and European, but North Indian and Arabic. The designs were very slow in being developed, the way we have them today, and they are very beautiful designs, but it took even centuries after they came into Europe for them to reach the beautiful form that they have now. <coughs> now, the, uh, the address here is my own, and if you ever want to write to me with questions, uh, you can use these figures. and get some air in between them. The street, the, number, the area can be kept rather short. You don't need to have tall casts. They're easier and better looking, I think, if they're kept short. Plenty of space in here. Well, you may or may not put the ST or the uh, spell out street, but it's adequate with it just like that. All right. Thought I had plenty of ink. I'm afraid I'll have to switch to, to the sepia. Oh, too much ink. Of course, with a small pen, it would go faster than this, but I want you to write slowly for some time. And not Right, even this fast. The postal department likes these abbreviations. And then you can put the zip right after it. Maybe even wider space than that if you have room. And I like to help out the poor clerk sorting mail in the post office by underlining the zip code in the mail that I send out. <coughs> and the postal department likes to have it come right after the abbreviation of the state. <coughs> now, I put July 4th down. <coughs> In old style, this looks, this looks much more like July 4th than uh, figures in modern lining figures. Because in the time of the revolution in America, they were using castle and types, and they had strong senders and descenders. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> this looks to me much more like, like the 4th of July, 1776. Now for the dates, B.C. See there? In short. What we call small caps that are just about five pen widths in height. The printer invented a distinct class of types called small types, which he uses with in, in the same printing with large types, but uh, mostly in book types you'll find them. And uh, he calls them small because they're only body height. <coughs> now, Anna Domini 
comes before the figure. This is the year of our Lord, 1066. You couldn't say 1066, the year of our Lord. It would be meaningless. So the BC comes after the year. The AD comes before the year. But the small caps in each case. <coughs> These small caps we use when we put the, the Sunday Google Play on the, an invitation that we write out. Now, these fractions, don't make them, these fraction figures, very small. They need to have some size in order to be legible. See, this is resting on the writing line, and the five extends down, halfway down to the descending line. <coughs> the dollar sign, I think, you should not think of as an S because this is too wide for an italic S. If the italic S is a rather narrow letter like that. But by making it wide, you have plenty of room to put those vertical parallel marks. So the dollar sign should always be in a rather spacious design. So <coughs> this coming up a little bit. And then, in the same way with the cent, uh, the centum, which means the hundredth part, uh, you want to have plenty of room for that. The regular italic C is just too narrow to make a good cent sign. So, uh, write 15 cents here. then it doesn't look crowded at all. Then I get the ST for first to close. And it's rather customary to tie the S in with the T. Might skid it a bit too. But that makes a nice counter, an interesting counter in here bind the two that way. <coughs> so do the same thing with the second. Without joining, however. Like that. Or these may be made small and put up high. But I think that it's better to have them the way I just did them. Is it difficult in a hurry to get these designs well made if you're making them that small? Better to make them just body height, then you're perfectly safe. Like that. <coughs> Dating your checks and putting the numbers on the checks uh, can make the can make the bank clerk. Uh, congratulate you, because they, they, they're always astonished to see writing that is, uh, is quite legible. And I have a friend, an ex-student, who uh, was in Philadelphia, and she tried to cash a check, and uh, the clerk looked at the check and exclaimed about the writing, what is it called, how beautiful it is, where did you learn it, how did you learn it, and so on. And the clerk turned into a nice human being for a change. And, and Italic will do this for you when you start using it. And, and then she came back to Portland and went into a bank that was, uh, she was unfamiliar with and handed a check in. And the clerk looked at it and said, you know, I'm having trouble with my Italic pen. It floods. She said, that's the difference between the two 
the two tongues. <laughs> well, let's try some more figures. Remember, the figures are designed to become the number. Now, when uh, I had this, as it refers to a particular quantity, that many years since the beginning of our era. <coughs> in, uh, in mathematics, you'll find uh, plenty of use for, for good pen work. It's a wonder that mathematicians haven't had us write out their textbooks because the, uh, the writing of, uh, or this typesetting of these things is extremely expensive, and a person could write it out by hand much easier than you'd have the thing set by type or pasted up from, from negatives. Now, when you have a, a superior power like that, it may be a little tricky writing it, but don't crowd it. Don't crowd it. It might be good to take a smaller pen. Uh, but be sure that it's small enough so that it doesn't isn't that it's 38, so that it does mean three multiplied by itself eight times. So it, uh, but it's a nuisance to pick up a smaller pen. So leave it that way. Well, the figures, uh, many people dislike the figures, but they can be beautiful, and I think you'll enjoy the, enjoy writing them once you're onto them. <coughs> 